Steve, how you doing? I am doing well. How are you doing? Not bad, thank you. Good. So, welcome back to DC. Ah, <laughs> you're welcome. Ready? Uh, yes. We're live. Okay. This meeting is being held pursuant to and in compliance with ordinance number 20-A-16, an ordinance to ensure the continuity of government during the COVID-19 disaster. 
Opportunities for the public to access, assess, and participate in the electronic meeting will be posted on the www.albemarle.org website or on our county on the county calendar when available. And so with that, if you would call to order our February 2nd, 2021 meeting, because Ponsatani Phil saw his shadow, and so we've got six more weeks of Zoom meetings at least. All right, uh, roll call here, Mr. Bailey. Present. Mr. Keller. Present. Ms. Firehall. Mr. Randolph. Present. Mr. Bivens. Yeah. Ms. Moore. Mr. Claiborne. Present. And Mr. Carazon. Here. I believe we have a quorum. All right. So our first our first piece of business this week, folks, is SP 202007, the Rappahannock Electric Cooperative. This is our this is our only public hearing. But before we do that, I have to do the consent agenda. And does anyone want to pull anything from the consent agenda? Does somebody make a will somebody move then to, to please accept the I uh, this is moved by Mr. Keller. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Daniel. Seconded by Daniel. So any further discussion? Hearing none. Sir, would you call the vote? Mr. Claiborne. Aye. Mr. Bibbins. Aye. Mr. Randolph. Aye. Mr. Keller. Aye. Mr. Bailey. Aye. There we go. Mr. Clark, welcome. Oh, I see you have a nice sunset behind. I just saw that sunset tonight. Or at least this well, part of the county. Yeah. Thank you. Oh. I'm spoiled. Y'all are spoiling us. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good evening. I'm Scott Clark. I'm a planner with the Community Development Department. This item is, is, is a public hearing for a special use permit request for a power line upgrade. Uh, the applicants are here if you have any questions once we get through the presentation. I'll give them just a moment to share my screen and get started. All right, can everybody see that title slide okay? Great. Okay. So the proposal is a special use permit request to upgrade an existing distribution line, which is a by right level of electrical line, the sort that typically carries power between neighborhoods and, and local areas, to upgrade the, that corridor and those poles to a transmission line, which requires special use permit. So in specific, this would install pole topper extensions on existing power line poles to increase the height of the poles from an average of 46 feet to a new height averaging about 82 feet. And on those new extensions, they would install a 115 kilovolt power line within the existing corridor that is about 1.6 miles long on the west side of US 29 and along the parcels that you can see in red here. The gray is the county's development areas, the white is in the rural areas. The north end is the Green County line. The overall width of the easement for the corridor would increase from 40 feet to 75 feet in order to accommodate the larger safety zones needed for the higher and uh, higher voltage lines. So I'll just show you a few pictures of the corridor as it exists at the moment. This is uh, by Advanced Mills Road and looking south, you can see portions of the corridor uh, are open to the highway, Route 29, which is an entrance corridor. Um, and you can also see here how these poles have been built uh, out of metal with a flat space on top where the extensions can be added on. I'll show you a, a graphic in a moment. This is another area a little farther south, a uh, grass area with some a narrow band of trees between the highway, which is on the right here, if you're looking north. Um, this is the view from the road, and you can see there's a thin band of trees along the edge of the road. There's the open area behind that for the existing power line corridor, and then behind that, 
in some cases there are more open areas, in some cases like this, there are wooded areas. This is just another view of uh, the existing corridor and the poles from the highway itself. To give you a quick explanation, uh, here is Dickerson Road where it meets Route 29 at the Ravenna substation. This new corridor would run from the Ravenna substation north to uh, the Green County line. You can see here in blue, blue dashes, the existing 40 foot utility easement. And then bracketing that in the lighter green is the proposed 75 foot easement. So the difference you can see there is uh, 17 and a half feet on each side. On the east side, which is down in this view, uh, the extension is into the VDOT right of way. So it's already clear area, it doesn't really make any difference, except for places along the very edge where there are some of those individual trees like I showed you. On the west side of the corridor, there's another 17 and a half feet of extension of the easement. And this covers a whole variety of, of land cover types from residences and yards to woods as you go along the corridor. Yeah, later, if you need to see it, I can show you the remainder of the pages of this plan. This is just the first page. Uh, just to give a sense of scale here, this west side increase, which is the one that was mainly impacting the vegetation, again, is 17 and a half feet wide, about 1.6 miles long. That gives you a rough area of about 3.4 acres in that expanded easement for the entire length of this proposed transmission facility. Here's a graphic from the applicants on what they proposed to add. This lower half here where you see existing structure height is what the poles look like now. And then there's the additional increase in height on top of that that should be bolted on for the higher voltage poles. And at the bottom, you can see the poles are currently centered in the 40 foot easement. They would remain centered in the 75 foot easement as it was expanded. And the applicants also provided a photo simulation of the change. Uh, some of you will recognize this uh, driveway and market here as the entrance is the prior or the property, excuse me, that abuts the Green County line. And so you can see the before view at the top there with the existing poles and after what it would look like with the addition of the extensions that would carry the higher voltage transmission lines. So uh, an analysis of the special use permit request. Uh, the main factor that we focused on with this review was consistency with the comprehensive plan. Of course, this is in a heavily traveled, and very important entrance corridor. And so we wanted to look at scenic resources and how that would impact it. The comp plan has several goals that talk about impact, about protecting scenic resources, not only in the county in general, but especially in these entrance corridors uh, and using design guidelines to help maintain the integrity of those corridors in the county. This project has been to the Architectural Review Board twice in May and in November. And I wanted to briefly explain how we approached the review here. Uh, as stated in the staff report to the ARB, there are clear limitations associated with screening utility lines. Um, just to explain that, I'll back up here and you imagine how ineffectual it would be to apply typical ground level screening standards to a pole like this. It's not an effective approach. Typical building design and infrastructure screening techniques cannot be effectively applied to utility poles 80 and 85 feet in height. So over the course of the review with the applicants and the ARB, our focus really was rather than trying to hide these pole extensions or screen them from view was to try to find a way to offset their visual impacts. They certainly have impacts on the corridor. We acknowledge that, but a simple attempt to block the view of them wasn't going to work. So we tried to find a way to offset that. After several rounds of discussion, uh, we began to talk with the applicants and their proposal in the ways that they could use their integrated vegetation management technique to offset the visual impacts of the poles. So you can see here that the existing corridor where it's open to the road is essentially mode clear at the moment. That's a typical management technique for 
there's little utility corridors like this, but it is kind of expensive for the utilities and obviously not very scenic for the communities. Uh, so the idea here is to improve the visual character of the utility easement by having taller, more varied vegetation in those currently fairly featureless corridor areas by allowing a select suite of species, not any invasive, not just weeds, but a select suite of native species of shrubs and low trees that could grow there without uh, causing a hazard to the overhead lines. Just to give you a couple of examples of what that looks like, these are examples pulled from other parts of the country, so no, this is not the site or even Albemarle, but a couple of examples of what integrated vegetation management looks like on the ground. This one is uh, aimed at more pollinator habitat and uh, some perennial but short-lived plants rather than trees um, that would come up every year, and uh, you can see how that's got some benefits to habitat of the insects and other animals that use that kind of territory. It also is uh, a bit more visually pleasing than just mowed flat to dirt. This is another example from the Eversource Energy Company up in New England. And this, uh, I don't know what those flowering trees are to be honest, but the idea this gives you of the, having an array of shrubs and smaller trees under the corridor um, even the poles here are very different, but the vegetation is similar to what would be proposed under an integrated vegetation management approach. There are a couple of caveats to this I just wanted to mention in order to be accurate. Uh, utility easement allows them to manage vegetation under these lines. Um, they can control what comes up and what doesn't. They can use the management techniques to affect the array of vegetation you have on there, but they don't control the right of the underlying landowners to remove what they want. So as I mentioned earlier, there are some places along this corridor where the line is going over residential yards. Those res residential yards would probably stay that way or could stay that way because the underlying landowners always have the right to also manage that vegetation. Another thing I should point out, some of those individual trees uh, that stand between the utility lines and US 29 are likely to be removed. Um, depending on the exact clearances, once the poles are up, the wires are in place, it's hard to say exactly right now which ones would stay and which would go. Um, of course, it'll change over time as they grow, but we should acknowledge that there will be changes on the edge of the highway itself. However, staff believes that the gradual change from bare soil and grass to shrubs and small trees will significantly improve the appearance of the utility easement along the So when this went uh, to the ARB in November, the board voted three to one to forward a recommendation of no objection to the proposal with the condition that the integrated vegetation management plan uh, be included as a requirement for the special use permit and that that plan include proactive management to promote uh, native species such as meadows, shrub landscapes, and pollinator species. Um, and also lower growing trees and other native vegetation that is compatible with safety needs and is visually pleasing when viewed from the entrance corridor. So we've adopted this direction into the conditions that I'll present to you in a moment. Uh, still on the comprehensive plan topic, um, the rural areas are generally focused on protecting natural resources and protecting the viability of rural land for agriculture and forestry. The good thing about this project is because it's reusing an existing corridor rather than carving a new one through the landscape, it's not creating any additional footprint and it's not blocking any access to any agri forestal land. So in summary, we've identified two favorable factors. Uh, and I should have mentioned this in more detail in the beginning, but the proposed upgrade would increase the reliability of electric service to area residents. Um, what I should have mentioned in the beginning is the uh, rationale for this particular project is the final step in a loop of transmission line connections that would allow the electric cooperative to significantly shorten power outages by having multiple transmission routes to their customers. If one line goes down, they've got another route to get there. And again, using the existing corridor is an improvement over creating a new corridor that would impact natural resources and agricultural lands. 
factors unfavorable, of course, are the pole height increase along the entrance corridor. And uh, recommended condition that I'll cover in just a moment that requires the integrated vegetation management would help to offset that visual impact by creating more visually pleasing vegetation in the corridor. So our recommendation is that the uh, planning commission recommend approval of the species permit with the following conditions. The first one is general accord with that plan that I showed you uh, with the poles remaining within that existing 40 foot right away that's there currently uh, and making sure that we've got a color match on the pole extensions. And second, requiring exactly that vegetation management plan that the ARB called for. So those would be the conditions recommended. Uh, I will be happy to answer any questions you all have. Uh, and if there are details about the operation of the lines or the electric cooperative overall, there are a few people here from the applicants who can answer those sorts of questions for you. Thank you very much, Phil. I'm going to share your screen just for a second so I can see. Ah, there we go. Are there questions for Scott? Or hey, thanks, Scott, for uh, the presentation. Um, as you were showing the the image of the, uh, I guess, the, the right of way and mm -hmm. non V that side, so on the property owner side. Is there ever an instance along the 1.6 mile corridor where an individual property owner is negatively impacted outside the visual impact that you've already you know, stated? Is there any other negative impacts that a property owner could have? The neighboring uh, land or the underlying landowners, of course, would have to agree to uh, this expanded easement. That's an, a following step. If the county approves this special use permit that includes the widened corridor, then the utility would have to work one-on-one -on -one with all of those landowners to uh, acquire that expanded right-of-way. Uh, it's possible that there would be some impacts, but generally what that's gonna mean is that the utility would have the ability to cut or trim vegetation that, that protrudes into that 75-foot easement. Mm -hmm. um, Essentially, you know, the work that's being done on the ground is only to pull the equipment in, I assume shut down the, the lower lines, add the pole toppers, add the new lines on, and they're done. There's not a lot of new entrance roads. There's, not a, there's no grading or landscape changes going on. It's literally just adding poles and adding wires. And then the wider uh, easement just allows maintenance to keep vegetation away from those higher voltage lines. Uh, that's great. And then I think I read the materials that the existing poles are already designed to accommodate this proposal here, which is looks like it started back in 2009. And so this has been a long process. Is it fair to say that today is not a surprise that this proposal will be coming or as a new company um, on the planning commission? Yeah, I don't know if, uh, if we in community development have been aware of the full proposal for that long, but certainly the utility was looking ahead to the, the upgrade potential and they do have bolt plates right on top of those poles where they can go ahead and do that. So um, this has been in the works for a while, but we've, I think we've had this under review with the county for about a year now. Thanks, that's all for me, thank you. And others, is there other questions? Louis, please. Yeah, thank you for the presentation. It's very thorough. I just wanted to make sure that in the images that you shared, the um, are there added lines along with this? So there's the lower lines that exist today, and then with the added um, top section, the high power lines, and those will be added. So, so there are more lines, or, or are the lower lines, do they go away? As far as I know, there will be more lines, the transmission, or the, sorry, the distribution lines at the lower side would stay and the transmission lines would be an additional function added on top. Um, if when we're done with the questions, if you'd like, I can pull back up the graphics to show you how that's, how that's set up. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Scott, if you could just go to that quickly before we move to the applicant or maybe, okay. someone, maybe someone will have a, a question, an additional question. Oops. 
Sorry about that. Here we are. Okay, so this is the graphic showing the uh, existing and extended poles. So here's that connector plate. Um, down below, you've got the existing distribution lines. And then, yeah, there's these three mounts for the uh, phases of the high voltage lines for the transmission facility that go on top of that. So all of that would be there. And then Thank again, you. here's the before and after. It shows lines on both. All right. Thank you. Are there other questions for Scott? No. Could we hear from the applicant, please? Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board or of the commission. I'm Valerie Long, uh, representing the applicant this evening, Rappahannock Electric Cooperative. Joining me um, are a number of representatives of Rappahannock Electric from our project team. I'll run through their names quickly just so you know who they are and what their roles are. And they will all be available to help answer any questions that I can't address. Um, first, we have Lee Brock, who is the manager of engineering and power supply. Sam Wilson, the director of substation and transmission engineering. Cindy Music, who is the director of vegetation management services and a certified utility corridor arborist. Also, Jeff Powell, the executive who manages their key commercial accounts, and Gary Durdock, who is the director of system planning and engineering design. So first, I want to thank Scott for his excellent presentation. He covered um, the vast majority of the issues and in a way that's uh, very was clear to me and uh, seemed to be clear to most of you all as well. So thank you, Scott, for all the time you took to understand this proposal and some of the uh, unique aspects of it. I do have a few additional slides to show. Many of them you have you all have already seen, but I will have them available and share my screen. Go. All right, let me just get my monitors here back in the right place. Um, first, let me speak briefly about sort of, again, a little bit more about the purpose of this proposal. Um, our Rappahannock Electric obviously is a rural electric cooperative. Its territory covers portions of 22 counties within Virginia. Only a very small portion of their territory is in Northern Albemarle. Again, it's this one point six mile span of their distribution line along the Route 29 South roadbed, but they do have over 2000 customers in Albemarle County. And that's a mixture of uh, residences, commercial businesses, institutional entities, including Rivanna Station and a number of other businesses and agricultural enterprises in the community. Again, this would add a 115 kilovolt transmission line on top of the existing distribution lines. Um, and to answer your question, Mr. Sorenza, the, uh, Scott was exactly correct that the existing poles will stay exactly as they are. They, or the existing lines will remain. The additional um, pole topper will just be added on top. And I have a few additional photo simulations that I can show you. So this is really an energy infrastructure uh, project. It will enhance the resiliency and viability of Rappahannock's um, system in this area and enable them to much more quickly restore outages to any of their member customers in the area. Let me um, go to the next one here. This is um, a map of the project corridor, um, just showing that essentially the starting point is right about Dickerson Road, which is here. Rappahannock Electric has a substation right here, just at the literally the outer edges of the development area. There's a small sliver of the parcel of the uh, GE intelligent, intelligent Platforms Systems property that also fronts on 29, but really the substation is the start of the project. And then it extends all the way up the 29 corridor up to the Greene County line. This is a map that was in our application package if you had an opportunity to look at it, but I'll provide a brief overview just to help orient you. This is the Rivanna substation that I just referenced. Dickerson Road is here. 
This is Route 29 North. This is the Green County line. This is the Madison County line. So this is the project span, approximately 1.6 to 1.7 miles. This is not the southern boundary of Rappahannock Electric's service territory. It's just the southern boundary of the project. They do have additional member customers whose parcels are to the south. And then of course they have a number of member customers whose parcels are on the east and west of Route 29. They have an existing substation um, off of Profit Road that already has a 115 kV transmission line that was put in about 10 years ago. Um, once this line, if it's approved and constructed, it will enable again Rappahannock to improve the resiliency and of their system and provide the ability for them to more quickly restore outages if there is, for instance, an issue on the line between the Rivanna and Profit substations, they can then backfeed power back from Pretty Creek and Pratt substations and vice versa. If there's outages, they can backfeed back and forth. So it's, a, it's an upgrade to their infrastructure. It does not increase the amount of the load, the power loads, it merely supports them. And one thing I should point out, which I um, imagine you all know, but just in case, Rappahannock Electric does not generate any, any electricity. It merely distributes it to its member customers. So they buy it wholesale from other generators and then distribute it along its network. So this line will not increase their generation, excuse me, doesn't increase any generation in power because they don't generate power. All it does is enable them to transmit and distribute it to their members in a more efficient and expeditious fashion. So it's a, again, it's a critical um, infrastructure upgrade, reduces the time of power outages when they occur due to severe weather or other circumstances. And with the unfortunate increase in climate change, as I'm sure you all have experienced, there have been increasing numbers of severe storms um, all over, but particularly in our area as well, um, increased number of outages. They're seeing more and more um, examples of that. So obviously this project is as important as ever. Mr. Claiborne, to address your question, you're correct that this project has been in the works essentially since 2009. They first approached the county at that time with this project, but unfortunately there was a procedural issue with the zoning ordinance because Rappahannock Electric is not an owner of any of these parcels. It did not have the ability under the county zoning ordinance to submit a special use permit application that's needed for the project. They couldn't find a solution to that problem in 2009, but they did go ahead and replace the poles that were wood poles at the time with metal poles they needed to be upgraded anyway. So they were planning ahead knowing that they would come back at some point in the near future uh, with a request for the transmission line. So they went ahead and upgraded them. The foundations are ready. They don't need any further work. Um, essentially they, um, they continued working on the plans and approached us in, I believe, 2017, 2018. We then started working with them, trying to find a solution to the procedural problem. Ultimately, with the assistance of the Community Development Department staff, the commission and the board, we did work with the county on a zoning text amendment that authorized a rural electric cooperative to submit an application. That was approved in December of 2019 and we submitted the special use permit application in February of last year, so just over a year ago. Um, so I hope that helps and happy to explain that further. Um, just to hit a few high points, um, let me go to the next slide. Um, you saw this image already, um, but I think what maybe is most helpful is showing that the 40 feet of the existing easement would be increased again by 17 and a half feet on either side. Um, one half is mostly on the VDOT side and the rest is on the landowner side. And again, Mr. Claiborne, in response to your question, um, Mr. Clark is exactly correct. There's no other impacts that would be um, imposed on any of those landowners aside from the widening of the easement area. There's no grading, there's no additional roads, no additional infrastructure of any kind um, other than needing to keep a wider easement area due to the taller poles and the higher voltage involved. You saw some of these exhibits as well. Um, I had these just to show the variety of types of 
uh, frontage on the along the corridor. You have Rivanna substation here. You have some residences here, some with some open areas, others with um, more wooded areas. You have a church here in this location. You have a number of parcels that are almost entirely wooded. And then this is the uh, last segment. This is the Green County line. You have a variety of um, conditions in this area from fairly wide open residential parcels to this is that commercial store here and then a few residential parcels with some vegetation here and here. So just to show the variety of conditions involved. This is the same photo that you already saw. And again, just to reiterate, nothing below, nothing that exists there now will go away or change. Everything new is up above vertically. And this is a second photo simulation looking to the north. For point of reference, this is taken from the intersection of Dickerson Road. And again, just the pole toppers on top, no additional grading, no additional construction, um, very, um, I was going to say even a minimal impact. I don't think there's really any impact on the ground, no grading, no clearing of um, any earth disturbance or installing the pole toppers. There was some information in, the, in our application package about integration, integrated vegetation management which is what the uh, applicant is proposing to use along the corridor to manage the vegetation. It is, I've learned a lot about it over the last year. It is the industry standard for how to manage vegetation in utility corridors. Of course, the main um, most important thing is avoiding um, conflicts between vegetation and the power lines. It's particularly important when you're dealing with higher voltage lines like this transmission line it's a method to manage the vegetation and promote um, po pollinator areas and meadows and compatible low growing species and try working to avoid and eliminate tall growing species that will be in conflict with the lines, the fast growing things, uh, um, invasive species, things like that. Um, but Rappahannock Electric, and again, Cindy Music, who is the uh, vegetation management specialist and arborist for Rappahannock is, is here with me and she can answer questions if you have any about this process much better than I can. But it is again kind of the industry standard for how to manage and balance the goals of safety of the lines, but also an attractive utility corridor that promotes ha animal habitat, meadows, low growing plants. And here's some photographs that we took uh, from the corridor, I believe back in September. I think these were taken right along the same time as the photos that Scott showed earlier. Um, there was uh, maintenance that took place on the corridor in over the summer, I believe it was July and August. And these photos were taken about mid-September, showing how the vegetation grows back fairly quickly. And also these photos show the variety of conditions that exist along the corridor. So you can see in some areas where lower growing trees that are not um, a risk to injuring the lines are allowed to stay and how the vegetation grows fairly quickly. This is another example, obviously looking south. This is a dead tree covered in vines because, and it's a little distorted. It kind of looks like it's up in the lines, but it's actually not. It's due to the angle it's taken from. It's a dead tree covered with vines. It's obviously not growing any taller. So Rappahannock allows it, you know, it stays there. It doesn't cause any safety problems. Their crew still has plenty of room to work around it. And it provides a nice habitat for birds and other species. And obviously just helps add vegetation to the right of way. These are some other photos taken fairly soon after the maintenance, showing some other vegetation that was left in place and some smaller trees that are not going to be in conflict with the lines. This is an example that Cindy um, flagged to me. I didn't realize it had any significance. I just took a picture of it, um, but it's a dead tree that they intentionally left there because it provides habitat for birds and obviously is not growing and getting taller. And a few other photos. This was one taken prior to maintenance and shows again how this was probably at the three or four year mark, how some of these low growing trees 
uh, we're able to continue growing and add a little bit of interest to the corridor, but not um, compete with the lines at all or be a danger. This was post maintenance where you see the, the vegetation already growing back fairly significantly. And you saw these photos again showing how, um, or you saw this picture earlier, but I, I wanted to include this because it demonstrates the point that Mr. Clark made that um, obviously these landowners retain the right to manage their property as they wish, so long as it does not conflict with um, Rappahannock Electric's needs in the corridor. And so some landowners choose to mow their lawn, you know, have a lawn and keep it mowed and open. Others want it wooded or some variety thereof. This one, you know, obviously demonstrates pre and post uh, maintenance, not any difference. Others, it will be more significant. This is another one that I thought was perhaps a good, this is the same um, spot taken from a little bit different angle. This is from Google Earth Street View. So that's why it's at a different angle. This was just before maintenance uh, took place at about the five, five and a half year mark. This was very soon thereafter showing how, um, you know, it grows back fairly quickly, particularly in the first year. And a similar photo here showing, this is actually just a couple of weeks later. Um, and I just thought this showed a little bit how it continues to grow in pretty quickly. And then this was fairly soon after maintenance as well, just about um, a month after. And this is another example of um, this property owner has obviously a lease with the billboard company and chooses to keep that area open and mowed so that the billboard's visible. And so it's already clear. Some of these, the easement would go back a little bit further, but it shows how the, in many portions of the corridor, the views will not be substantially different. And one more here, landowner's property showing that open area. Um, there's been some discussion and questions from some members of the public and others about why don't you, why do you have to do this along 29? Why can't you put this transmission line in a different location so it's not along an entrance corridor? Um, we wanted to show Rappahannock Electric did consider that issue, but ultimately decided that this was the, uh, that utilizing the existing poles along an existing corridor was by far the lowest impact of the alternatives. The, obviously the slide on the right here shows the approximate location of the alternate route that um, is workable for them. As you can see, it would require um, easements and clearing along a very large, very long span, um, disrupting a number of other landowners. Um, yeah. Along the existing corridor, they can add this line with relatively minimal impact on those landowners other than the widening of the easement area. So we think for many reasons, that's the best solution for this issue. There's also streams and stream buffers along this area and utilizing the existing line would not have any impact on any streams, stream buffers or any sensitive areas. Counselor, counselor. Yes. My I'm time going, yeah, your time is up. You, okay. you, have been, you have an innate ability to know that your time is up. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to ask you to unshare your screen and I'm going to ask to see if any of my colleagues have questions for you now before we go to the public hearing Great. part of this. I actually timed it well. I was finished. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Questions for the applicant. Tim. I have a question for Ms. Long and a question for Ms. Music. Um, Ms. Long. Um, you know a great deal about what we can do with uh, both high tension lines and cell towers. Um, is there the possibility that there could be um, a cell tower array added to the top of any of these poles once the pole topper has been put on them? Um, I don't know if there um, if the foundation is designed for that, I, I, well, I can say I know it wasn't designed for that. It was designed for the addition of these pole toppers. I, I, I guess if there were a wireless provider that was interested and the Rappahannock folks were willing and they could do a study and, and look at whether the foundations were strong enough to support the additional weight of wireless antennas and equipment, um, they could potentially consider that. 
But as I think you know, Mr. Keller, the weight of the equipment, the antennas, and those um, the lines that are required for those are incredibly heavy and usually are not able to be added to existing structures that have not been intentionally designed for that. But I can't speak to that issue. It looks like Ms. Brock's body language was that she needs to weigh in on this. Okay. Um, I don't, can you unmute yourself, Lee? There you go. Yes. <laughs> My boss always says I, I couldn't play poker. <laughs> um, yes, no, they would have had to have been designed specifically for that. Um, we will be allowed, you'd be allowed to install um, fiber optics below, and I think there already is some of that. But um, as far as on top, no, they were not designed for that. And just as a follow-up, um, if there was a request from a cell tower and it was involving just reworking one tower, would that be something that would be considered? They'd have to pay for the whole thing, and and sure, we would we would look at it, um, but. I would think that we'd we'd have to replace the whole the whole thing. Um, I I don't think it would be. It would surprise me if it was um, economical for them. And if Mr. Fritz is still on, just to continue this, so that we can sum this up once and for all. Um, if if that was possible, how many feet would it be able to go up, and would would there be any recourse on the part of the county? So there are two options there. One would be to do a tier one facility, which is an attachment to an existing structure, and it could not be any taller than the existing structure. They could propose to expand the structure, and that would be a special use permit tier three, and it'd be whatever it was, the application was. Uh, it would be reviewed, may or may not be approved. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. And Chair, I'll bring that back when we have our discussions later. I just wanted this information for the public and for the commissioners. The, my second question is about tree pruning. I, I think that um, what we find, those of us that travel to other parts of the country were constantly amazed that a commonwealth to the north, the commonwealth of Massachusetts, seems to have such more sympathetic pruning of trees along uh, power line right of ways than what we see in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And I wonder if the vegetative management person could speak to that because that is another component. That is the higher visual component that forms the backdrop that we'll be looking at as we progress uh, north and south on Route 29. Um, I believe in, in Massachusetts, there are um, different statutes that apply to state road right of ways and that um, there may or may not be larger easements. So, I mean, if, if you have a larger easement, obviously you don't need to have as much of a pruning cut because you, the trees don't simply exist, meaning they're further back. And so, you know, it's, it's not as obvious that they've been pruned. Um, I think in Virginia, um, we kind of stick to our smaller easements in this case that um, you know the trees may be closer, so they have to be pruned. As it sounds like you have done some are interested in this, and of course, you know certain species grow faster than others. So, you know, if you have a maple, you can have anywhere between six and seven feet of growth per year. Um, if you have something like an ailanthus, you can have that in um, the early season. So, um, you know, it's a prescriptive approach. It's very specific to species. And um, as Ms. Long mentioned, um, REC and most utilities um, take an integrated vegetation management approach. So pruning is part of that, of course. Um, and then also um, allowing certain species to grow larger, um, you know, if they're not to get up into the, the wire zone. Thank you. You're welcome. Questions for the applicant, Corey. 
Uh, thank you for the presentation. Quick question on the, the overall project and, and the future of it. I saw a slide where it showed the uh, the line going through our neighboring counties of Brigham and Madison. Is the intention that this upgrade will go to those counties? And if so, what's that timetable? This is part of an overall infrastructure upgrade that REC is working on. So it's just the Albemarle County segment of the upgrade. Um, other portions, um, as you may have seen on the slide, there's portions that exist in green. There's a segment where it doesn't exist and it's a, not yet existing in Madison. So in those counties, there will also be upgrades. But in those counties, transmission line is allowed by right as compared to an album raw, which were, requires a special use permit. So REC wanted to be sure that it could get the special use permit approved in album raw in order to then move forward with the rest of the project. In terms of timetable, um, assuming that the SUP is approved um, sometime in the next year after or in the next few months, it will take approximately a year, they think, to work with each of the uh, landowners who own property within the project area to negotiate easements and terms with each of them. And then after that, it's about a four to six month pro project process to uh, get the, the new pole choppers installed in the line. So roughly about a year and a half um, from the date of approval in the to finish the Albemarle County section and I'm going to look to Lee and Sam Wilson at REC to weigh in if there's anything additional to add. Um, this, I don't know if the green and Madison portions that aren't already built will come after that. And is that about another six month process um, before everything's complete? Where's Sam? Sam, I'm going to let you do the timing, but yes, we'll, we'll continue on up. But Sam, you can talk about the timing. Yeah, timing wise, uh, we'll be going, actually, I'm assuming we'd start from both sides. Um, from started working with landers on both both sides because we have to go with easements from on the rest of the line. So we'll continue the process. It will be several years before it's all done because it is, I don't remember the total mileage, if, um, but it's, it's going to take a little while, but um, we will we'll be going in parallel while we're working with Avon Mall. We'll be working on the others once we get a final approval. If we if we get a final approval, I should say. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. We're going to go to Rick and then Daniel. Uh, Valerie, isn't it safe to say that actually what you're looking at here in terms of a project is the extension of a spur that goes from the main transmission line down into Albemarle County? So it's equivalent to a railroad that we have a unidirectional line and it terminates right there at Dickerson Road. Um, and when you conceive of it, I think in that way, then you get a better understanding that it isn't that any energy being generated is going from Albemarle North. It's quite the opposite that where the energy is generated by Dominion Power is in fact going down this spur coming into the critical uh, infrastructure that exists in the business park, which are strategic growth industries for Albemarle County. The other thing that I do feel would have been helpful in looking in your application, um, especially for new members of the planning commission that may not have had exposure to this before, is to have cited the fact that the major reason for this project is because you're upping the overall kilowatts of energy that is going to be distributed on these power lines. And the reason for why, therefore, there's a need for the power lines to be higher is from a safety factor that the increased power, therefore, with the electromagnetic currents that are generated thereby, is at a safer distance from human beings and any animals that would be below. We certainly saw that on the Cunningham to Dooms project um, with Dominion Power when I was on the board in 17 and 18, um, where they 
up the overall power generation of 500 kV on that line. And so the towers had to get much taller and the lines had to be separated. So just, it, it's not a criticism, but I'm just pointing out that I didn't think the narrative emphasized enough the public safety aspect as to why this project is being initiated in Albemarle County to protect human life um, along this improved corridor with increased power coming into the Ravenna station area. Thank you, Mr. Randolph. I appreciate you pointing that out. You're correct. It will certainly utilize the portions of the infrastructure that are in other jurisdictions for the, for the great benefit of Albemarle County and its institutions and businesses. So thank you for clarifying. And yes, it's about safety for everyone as well. So thank you. Daniel. Sorry, I'm mute. Uh, I think it was covered, you know, the, the hype for safety. Um, this is clearly, you know, putting in a transmission line versus a distribution line to create a network of substations. I'd like to see, and it, it didn't necessarily, um, I don't think it was called out, but when Governor Northam signed the Virginia Clean Economy Act that was really to promote the adoption of renewable energies, you know, one of the key part of that is a is a modernization of the infrastructure and the transmission and distribution infrastructure um, to allow, you know, utility scale solar or commercial solar to connect into distribution lines. It means a substation has to, has to have enough capacity to, to handle those interconnection fee requests, and then it has to be able to be distributed to other parts or, or wherever it's going to be serviced. And I th I'd like to understand, you know, understand the, you know, fault tolerance, multiple paths um would like to see if you could maybe add some to the narrative around how this may help Rappahannock and others and virginia and albemarle county thereby meet some of those and assist in some of those um goals to decarbonize and to adopt clean energy thank you mr bailey i may need to draw on the resources of our team here to address that specifically um i can speak to one issue Obviously, for the benefit of others, you're exactly right about the Virginia Clean Economy Act and the incentives and, and um, other provisions it includes to upgrade and modernize and promote renewable energy. Um, as I'll, I'll ask Lee or Sam or, or others on the team to address his specific questions about um, those details, but because um, I'm not sure I'm, those are in my wheelhouse. I'll let Lee or Sam or whoever's the right person from the team jump in. As far as generation goes, we are an, a distribution electric cooperative, which means we don't um, generate power. I always say we're kind of like the BJ's Wholesale Club. We, we buy it at wholesale and sell it and distribute it to our members. This project is not going to increase generation or really increase load. What it's going to do is make it available, a back feed, um, a second source to this area. So the load will all stay the same, um, just during a time of outage, you won't be out as long. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? I, I think Mr. Bailey had an additional point he was making there. Daniel, why don't you try and expand that? Because I don't think it's about that. I think it's whether or not the system, this upgrade, allows you to have a diverse to diversify your your receipt of power as opposed to your distribution of power. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's more of just trying to understand, you know, does this enable uh in this increased ability to not just distribute power, but to transmit power through these uh, transmission lines. Um, and here I am, the you know substation. Um, I know I'm not a utility, I'm not a solar producer, uh, but I've worked with a, a lot. And one of the things they look for is, you know, where's parcels near substations and distribution lines to get it to there to, you know, push it up to do transmission lines and other lines. And I was just trying to understand. I understand that you don't, you don't install solar fields or, or others that you would supposedly purchase from a vendor like Apex or, or many of the others in the Almar County area that do do that to- We don't purchase from them. 
will interconnect mm -hmm. them for purchase. Right, that's what I meant. Yeah. To, yeah. Um, that is that could be possible. Um, given the area, though, right along Route 29, I, it would surprise me if anyone wanted to connect right on 29. Mm -hmm. But you know, we are we are bound by state law to at least entertain their application, um, and we would. But okay. so this know, particular segment in Elmore County won't won't help or pr produce any knock on clean energy um, opportunities based on what you just said. That well, doesn't necessarily mean the full infrastructure that you're working on in the grand plan would or would not. Is that correct? If I understand what you're saying, um, correct. Yeah, just trying to understand. I mean, that's one of the questions and we have, we, we're trying to understand like, you know, how are, how is this modernization and is there opportunities for clean energy to and, and to comply with some of our comprehensive plan and it does this permit opportunities yes. and it doesn't sound like this particular project does and it it could it just depends you know what what developers of mm -hmm. uh, solar are looking for is a very large area of flat mm -hmm. land that is right near a transmission line <clears throat> i don't know that i see that mm -hmm. in this area of Albemarle. Um, but should somebody come in and, and want to you know, clear cut a bunch of land and put solar and, and you guys are okay with it and they want to um, connect into our transmission line, we would, we would entertain that because we have to. Thanks. Daniel? Does that answer your question? Oh uh, yeah, more or less. Thanks. Anyone else? I have one, just one sort of clarifying question for Ms. Music, and that is in this additional 17 and a half feet, uh, let's say looking towards the property line, is, is it, should we expect that those trees over there that come in, that the trees which will be found there will be eliminated? Correct, yeah. And that's, that's to, um, you know, allow for, um, Clear fall, 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 so for fall lines and so that they don't so that they don't interfere with the, exactly. the distribution with the um with the transmission yeah. lines. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. I just want to get clear. Yeah. 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 But along those lines, um, pun intended, there would also be um, you know, natural regeneration that goes on immediately afterwards, like like Miss Long's pictures were showing. Um, sorry, my dog decided to join me. Um, you know, regeneration occurs rather rapidly. And um, so, you know, there will be low growing shrubs and trees, um, small trees allowed to um, remain, you know, after they, they re-sprout. And if you've ever seen an area that's been cleared like that, that happens really rapidly. The, the question I have for your follow-up I might before we go to the public hearing is that, one of the things we're talking about is a native Virginia meadow. Well, some of that doesn't happen all by itself. It has to be encouraged. It has to be managed. Right. In those places where we do have pollinators, where we, there's some places in, in the county that have pollinator fields, they, they're actually intentional. They're, you know, they've been planted and they've been looked after and things like that. And I didn't see, although I'm, I'm pleased to see that staff put it in as item number two, I didn't see in your, in your, um, in your IVM, that you were going to intentionally be engaged in, in managing or created, creating a, um, a natural area. And so, so integration, integrative vegetation management actually is an intentional way of managing property. And, um, and if you look at power line corridors that are managed in this way, what it does is basically suppress forest succession. Mm -hmm. So, you know, after clearing, you would naturally have just a plethora of trees. The, the seed source is existing in the soil and, you know, they're going to regenerate along with forbs and ferns and pollinator species and what have you. So in order to have that um, pollinator habitat, what you have to do is suppress the trees, which suppresses forest succession, which maintains that meadow look. Um, it can be done through planting. It is usually done almost as efficiently simply by using what's existing seed sources in the soil. 
Okay. So, you know, until, um, you know, and that's, and that's something that's been done forever, right? Um, mm -hmm. Just naturally. Mm -hmm. But yes, we, we, we do that through IBM. Okay. Are there other questions for, for the applicant? Then I'm going to open the public hearing and I'm going to ask Carolyn if you would uh, move us through that, please. Yes, I have uh, Robert Ray Messick. Um, Mr. Messick, please unmute yourself. You will have, please set your name and address. You will have three minutes to start speaking as soon as you unmute. Uh, hi, uh, my name is uh, Robert Ray Masick. Um, uh, my family uh, has owned this property for many years, uh, probably 120 or so. Um, my grandmother originally granted uh, the uh, uh, gave the right away to uh, Rappahannock Power Company in 1950, early 50s. Um, you know, this was a distribution line, and uh, that was fine. And then my mother in the early 70s gave them uh, a, a, a more uh, right away. Um, for more distribution lines with the understanding that it wasn't going to be a transmission line. And um, so now we uh, are getting a transmission line supposedly without arm extensions. Um, these, line, these lines are going to be very close to the pole, but uh, nobody will guarantee me that they won't put either on these poles or some other poles uh, arm extensions. This is the beginning of uh, Albemarle County. Um, we've left it green. My sister and I loved growing up there uh, when we were kids. And um, it hasn't changed much since we were, were young. And, um, but I feel that this power line now has become an industrial <laughs> uh, eyesore. Uh, at the entrance of Albemarle County. Um, and I guess the other thing is, uh, you know, uh, uh, local generation of electricity. I mean, um, uh, there's been a, you know, a revolution in the last uh, four or five years since this whole thing was planned for, um, um, solar, solar energy uh, and wind energy. Um, we are going to have to get off of burning fossil fuels and, um, and um, uh, Lake Anna is a uh, power plant is now 75. Well, I guess it's uh, about 50 years old and uh, they might extend it, extend it for another 25, but at some point uh, North Hanna is not going to be in service. Um, anyway, that's, uh, that's my comment. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. That is the only one I had with a hand up. Oh, wait, I have um, Eric and Amber Myers. Please. Hold on once, okay. Your name and address, uh, if you're with a group and organization, please state that and your time starts now. You have three minutes. You're muted. We still can't hear you. There we are. There we are. There we are. Can you hear him? I can't. Sir. Yeah, we can't hear. Sir. Can see you, but we cannot hear you. It won't unmute. 
There you go. You You're got good. it now. We can hear you. Okay. Can hear you. I'm sorry. Can hear you. Sorry about that. Starts now. Sorry, Bo. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Eric Myers, and I'm representing Marie M. Myers. She's a property owner on uh, uh, 29 North there uh, at the Phrase Mill Road, uh, 29 South intersection. And uh, there, uh, w my uncle is Robert uh, Mestic, who just spoke. And uh, we have a great appreciation for this property. Uh, I was driving home today, looked over and saw the mature oaks that would a lot of them would have to be taken down. They are as tall or taller than the current transmission line and, in my opinion, help blend uh, the current transmission line. I just want to give a few facts. Um, you know, they're talking about the regrowth under there and things like that. But in looking at the climate action plan and the uh, biodiversity plan for the county, I just like to quote a few facts, scientific facts about mature oak trees. One oak tree, a mature oak tree, can produce 10,000 acres per year, which helps support, support wildlife forage. During growing season, a mature oak uh, can transpire up to 40,000 gallons of water, which helps cool the atmosphere, including their canopies. It takes 35 years for an oak tree to produce its first small crop of acorns. And a 100-year-old 100, 100 oak, which some of these are, has, request, has sequestered 5,000 pounds of carbon during its life. And if you, know, you just multiply that by the number of trees there. So um, I, I don't quite um, agree with the saying there's little environmental impact that um, I have a degree in environmental science. And I just, yes, there would be grasses and things like that, but the loss of transpiration and canopy uh, doesn't seem to go along with the climate action plan, the October 2020 plan that is um, Albemarle County is uh, committed to. So I have a great appreciation for the property. I walk it um, many times a year. I've seen lots of wildlife. Our, our family intends to keep it wild if we can. And uh, I greatly appreciate this opportunity to speak um, on behalf of my mom and for this property and the environment. Thank you, sir. Ms. Carolyn, anything, anyone else have their hand? That is them? it. Thank you very much. Uh, close the public hearing part of it. And uh, if the applicant has a few moments that they'd like to respond, please do. Otherwise, we will move to our deliberations. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll make just a few brief comments and um, response to those. Um, Mr. Messick is correct that the solar market and renewable energy market is continuing to increase. Um, as Mr. Bailey indicated, that's a key component of the Virginia Clean Economy Act that was just um, enacted last year. Um, certainly that is likely to continue to increase. Um, some of the power that REC purchases now from wholesalers is generated from renewable sources. So while they don't generate the power, as they've said, they purchase it wholesale, some of it is renewable and it's very likely that that will continue or, or only increase in the future. Regardless, that does not diminish the need for this transmission line going forward. This is about um, enhancing the infrastructure, being able to restore power to REC's member customers in a very timely fashion to reduce outages whenever possible um, it, it would not have an impact on that issue. Um, Mr. Messick also made a comment, which he shared with us previously about concerns for, I believe what he's concerned about is that the, these poles would be replaced with much, much taller poles, the reference to kind of those having arms. I, I believe that's the concern. Um, the type of structures you see, um, you know, with a 230 kilovolt line that Dominion Power might run, that is not at all what's planned here. The images that we showed you of the pole toppers are exactly what's what's proposed. That's what the foundations for these poles are designed to hold. Um, they don't have any plans to increase the size of the structure and I don't think they would be able to anyway. And then uh, with regard to Mr. Meyer's comments, um, you know, we don't dispute that, you know, the, the value of vegetation and trees and uh, to the economy and, and climate in general. Um, it is unfortunate that the larger uh, transmission lines do require a larger easement area. Um, one thing I did not mention is that typically REC's 
standard easement width for a transmission line is actually 100 feet wide. Um, that's the width of the easement for some of y'all were on the commission when Central Virginia Electric Cooperative um, obtained a special use permit for their project they called Cassius Corner in, uh, I believe in the Keswick area. That had an existing 100 foot easement already. Um, and again, that's REC standard, but because they're able to utilize this existing line and for a variety of other reasons, the ability and, and the recognition um, of, of the goal of trying to minimize the impact on these property owners absolutely as much as possible, they were able to secure permission to uh, reduce the easement width to the full 75 feet. So it is just 17 and a half feet. Um, additional land um, for all the parcels, which certainly to those individual landowners absolutely is um, significant. And we certainly appreciate that. Um, that is why they, they worked hard to minimize the impact and are using this existing corridor instead of um, resorting to a brand new corridor that would impact a whole nother group of landowners. We think this has the least impact. And I know Mrs. Myers is fortunate. She and her family, they own um, I think over a hundred acres of what looks like is mostly wooded land, maybe even more just in the project areas, a hundred acres. So there will be substantial um, wooded areas remaining as a result of their good stewardship of their property for all of these decades. And likewise with Mr. Messick's property. Um, so we wish that we didn't have to expand the easements and do any more tree clearing, but unfortunately that's part of um, the requirements of this infrastructure upgrade. So just know we're trying to minimize that to the extent possible. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So it's back to us kind folks. It's not even late. Everyone's thinking, do I need to ask someone to speak? Thank you, Rick. I'll move approval SP 2020-00007 Rappahannock Electric Cooperative, the recommendation in the staff report. So we have it. We have a we have a motion on the floor. Would someone like to second it? Second. I, uh, Corey, second it. How about some discussion, folks? Tim, please. Tim, I need you. I'm not, there you go. There you go. I was having trouble. Um, well. I think that I'll start off by saying that I'm going to support this, but I, I find the vegetation management plan almost disingenuous because I don't know that it's particularly different from what's done along many of these quarters where there's a bush, we bush hog and then, and then sprouts come up and then we bush hog later. Maybe we're going to allow it to be there a, long, a bit longer, but I would need to know more about, I, I think in response to your question, Chair, we didn't get a real response as to whether there's then going to be selective elimination of invasives and allowing natives to grow up and mature in whatever fashion they elect to be, ferns in a shaded area, rhododendrons in a different kind of shaded area. And the, and the photographs shown by Mr. Clark of rhododendrons the rolling hillside that we could find in some of the quarters mm. in Southwest Virginia um, are certainly appealing if we could see that. So I think we need to understand that it's still going to be pretty raw and pretty rugged and that what has historically been a beautiful entry corridor on 29 North, which is being degraded in many different, for many different land, land use manners, um, is going to continue and we're, we're each time something like this happens, we lose a bit of that scenic quality that makes us special. Mm -hmm. But I think the fact that it is next to the corridor and that it's not going through a number of parcels is beneficial. And 
while I don't believe that I'm going to live long enough to see an alternative to the cell towers and the high tension lines, I do believe we're going to see energy fixes. And just as the telegraph poles and the telephone poles have gone away from much of the American landscape over the last 100 years, we will see these disappear in the next 100 years. So I'm supportive and I'm ready to, to do a second to Rick if there are not other comments. Oh, we have a second by Corey. It's been, we're, we're in this discussion. We're in the discussion period right now. Are there any other? Are there any other uh, comments or discussion before we go to a vote? Daniel, uh, yes, Andy. Mr. Chair, just before the vote's taken, if I could clarify, Mr. Randolph's motion was it to approve with the conditions recommended by staff? Yes. Okay. Just wanted yes. to clarify that for the record. Yes, it was. It was. And then it was seconded by Corey. Corey, is that what you see? Corey, is that what you thought? Yes, fine. So it's it was well, Andy. It was moved in. It was seconded. Yes, Daniel. Yeah, I uh, just also lean, you know, toward support. Uh, given you know some of the other things we we you know power is a is a need. Um, I just would like to say that in addition to the you know IVM plan, as as Mr. Keller has pointed out. You know, there is a visual, and I mean, that's a pretty significant visual impact. It's doubling the size. And, and so I, I think it will have uh, somewhat of a, a, you know, especially on the instruments corridor, uh, an impact on the character of the corridor um, a, a bit. Uh, um, so anything that can be done with IBM and, and more specificity to bring back some of that to soften uh, the man made structures, I think would be um, very impactful to. Um, trying to keep that character that uh, Mr. Keller alluded to that makes it special. Um, I would also state that, you know, I know that's a uh, getting, I, I know, I know, it, I, I know it's, I, I looked at the website for Rappahannock and, and seen some of the things around the, the clean energy and understanding the substation and mm -hmm. transmission and all that, um, having a better understanding as you maybe go before the board of, of, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not an, I'm not an electric expert by any means. I'm not pretending to be, but you know, I know you're a consumer of electricity. But if you also have an existing infrastructure and substations that need to be able to handle load that is produced by, uh, you, you know, solar and wind farms and other things, have to be able to receive it somewhere and then transmit it to where it's actually consumed at. And so, understanding how that may or may not. And maybe not just in Almaral County, but how in the grand plan of Rappahannock and this modernization that you're going through can help support that um, would be, you know, would be really, really nice to know from a from a planning commission perspective of trying to support clean energy and decarbonization. Okay. Anyone else have a comment that they'd like to have before we vote? Sir. Thank you for these comments. They've been very helpful. Thank you, sir. Mr. Claiborne. Aye. Mr. Bivens. Aye. Mr. Randolph. Aye. Mr. Keller. Aye. Mr. Bailey. Aye. Ms. Firehawk. Aye. Thank you very much. So the applicants, you've gotten some good advice, I think, on perhaps how to fine tune your presentation before going before our supervisors. So hopefully you will uh uh, inwardly digest that as you go forward. Thank you for your time this evening, kind people, and uh, we'll go forth. Thank you very much. We do appreciate the feedback and, and appreciate the comments this evening. Thank you very much. Uh, it's 19, it's 720. Are we ready? Can we continue to roll folks? I see no one shaking their head. Okay. Then, in that note, we're having a presentation this evening on proposed fee schedule changes. And remember, with a presentation, we are asking for a comment one or two or one and a half from us. And we will not be having a public hearing or any public comment. So, with that, uh, remember, engage and uh thank you mr allshouse steve allshouse please oh i need to say a, pre a, a presentation on the proposed fee schedule changes please may we hear from mr allhouse 
Yes, thank you, Chair Bivens, members of the Planning Commission, Steve Allshouse, Department of Community Development. Uh, please bear with me for a minute while I bring up my presentation. One second. Okay, are we good? Can you see that? Yes, it's good. Thank you. You're 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 good. Okay, very good. Um, so what I want to accomplish this evening was to give you some general background information regarding CDD's works to update its fees. I want to talk a little bit about staff work that we've done as of the end of January. I uh, want also to update you about tasks that still need to be completed, our remaining timeline, and then I thought I would yield your questions. So specifically what I'm gonna talk about tonight is chapter 18 of the county's code. This is the portion that deals with zoning. I'll be limiting my comments to that chapter. And just as background, um, the county's CDD fees um, were established in a fee study that was conducted by PFM Group, which is based in Arlington, Virginia, back in 2007. The mm -hmm. county conducted contracted with PFM to do a study, it was exhaustive. And in 2008, the board adopted the fees and also adopted a policy whereby existing fees were supposed to be adjusted every two years based on board adopted staff salaries. So for example, if staff salaries that were approved by the board increased between the two years by 4%, CDD fees were supposed to go up commensurately, also then by 4%. Unfortunately, this policy has not always been applied. Um, it's not been applied routinely. Most CDD fees were last updated in November of 2015. So it's been about five years, um, a little bit more than five years now, since the fees were last updated. The issue that we're facing in CDD is that due to this lack of an increase since that time, we're seeing an increasing disparity between our revenues and our costs. In other words, CDD is providing services in 2021 and charging the 2015 price. Also, another issue that's come to light um, recently is that there are services that CDD provides the public that are not covered in the current, um, the current county code, uh, but we have identifiable costs that we're incurring by providing services. And we propose some new fees to try and address those issues. I'm also gonna talk briefly about a technology fee that we're proposing. So as of January, staff has developed a tentative set of calculations for updates to existing fees using the 2008 board adopted policy. These increases for the existing fees, if adopted, would increase the fees by about 10%, which is commensurate with the level of salaries, the increase in the level of salaries since 2015. Um, also, staff has identified services related to architectural review and has proposed new fees based on those services and the calculation that's gone into those fees is, is this. We've looked at the relative amount of time it takes to do certain architectural review projects and have related those to other, other fees that the, the department does. So we have a relative understanding of how the time is um, or, or how much time it takes to do something that we're proposing and how much time it would be um, related to for another type of activity. And that's where we're coming up with our fees. We're basing it commensurate on the amount of time relative to other tasks. One other fee that we're proposing, as I mentioned earlier, is a technology fee. This fee is envisioned uh, to be applied toward replacing the, the county's county view software system. Now, I know some of you are new to the planning commission and members of the audience who might be listening in might not know what county view is. County view is our system that tracks development. Um, everyone in CDD uses it. Uh, members of the public can use it. When it was initiated 16 years ago, it was cutting edge and was very useful to the Department of Community Development. However, uh, the system is 16 years old. And if you're familiar with software, you know that 16 years is a very long time for a system to be in use. Uh, specifically, we have um, 
see a number of, of add-ons put into the system. Um, and it's become very cumbersome for us to use it. We feel that our, our end users and the public also um, likely are finding it to be cumbersome to use. So what we're hoping is if the technology fee is adopted, that this would help fund um, a new system for CDD. And it's possible that the system would be um, integrated across the county as an enterprise reporting system, and also could help streamline the development review process. Uh, we're hoping also that a newer system would be much more user-friendly than the current system. Some of the other work that's gone on with regard to the fees update is we've been looking at other jurisdictions and their development related fees and finding out if, the, if what we're proposing is consistent, um, is reasonable uh, based on what we're seeing in other jurisdictions. This effort is ongoing. Um, the initial look that I did several weeks ago uh, had a focus, uh, first of all, on the technology fees. So I looked at Fairfax County and Montgomery County because both of those jurisdictions have a technology fee. Um, they're the only two, as far as I know, in the Commonwealth of Virginia that do have a technology fee, by the way. I also looked at the city of Alexandria because, as you might be aware, Alexandria does a lot of historic preservation work. Um, and they have fees that pertain to that. And the thinking was that those fees that are charged in Alexandria would be similar to the fees that we're proposing here in Albemarle. So I wanted to get an idea of how reasonable um, our proposals were in, in connection or compared with those in, that exist in Alexandria. Also took a look at the city of Charlottesville because that is our neighboring jurisdiction. We are all part of the same reason, region. Um, but uh, I would like to point out that we're going to be looking at some additional jurisdictions um, for comparability purposes. We feel that Hanover and Rico, James City County, and Roanoke County are all comparable um, to varying degrees with Albemarle. And to look at their fee structure and fee level would be instructive for us. Also, in the last several weeks, we've been engaged in some outreach. Um, we initially sent out an email blast to everyone who's on the county's email, email system and also to anyone who's done business either building or planning with the Department of Community Development in the last two years. Um, what these emails have done is alert people of the proposed changes, um, it gives them a link to the underlying documents and also provides a feedback box that they can use so that if they have any comments or questions, um, they're able to, lead, to send those to us. And when that happens, those comments and questions are sent to myself and the department leadership. Now, as of the end of January, we've had on that page approximately 650 visits and unfortunately only one comment, mm -hmm. um, and that was a comment that dealt with chapter seven, not chapter 18. Um, and in any case, it was just one out of 650 visits. Now, that being said, the deadline for comments is not until February 26th of this year. Um, so it might be that we see a rush toward the end. I just don't mm -hmm. know, but so far we've had very little feedback from the website. The second part of our outreach that we've undertaken uh, took place a few weeks ago, January 19th and January 21st. On January 19th, we met, we staff met with Blue Ridge Home Builders Association, Jenny Tapscott in particular, the Free Enterprise Forum, Neil Williamson, Southern Development, Charlie Armstrong, and Great Eastern, uh, um, David Mitchell. Uh, met with them for about an hour and a half and got their feedback and commentary. Um, also on January 21st, we met with representatives from the Southern Environmental Law Center and the PEC. From the ES SELC, we met with Travis Piatella. And from the Piedmont Environmental Council, we met with Christopher Hawk. Um, mm -hmm. Again, it was about an hour long meeting in both cases. Got a lot of very good feedback from these meetings. Um, what we gleaned from these meetings were three, three issues, two of which were um, pretty common, and the third one which came up that we're looking into. The first one, as I mentioned um, or alluded to earlier, was that the uh, group desires fee comparisons with the ju additional jurisdictions. Um, that's very reasonable. If we're about to ask for a fee increase, we want to know how we're looking in comparison with other localities. Another very, very important 
item that came up was wondering, um, participants were wondering about the impact of fees on affordable housing. Um, anytime you increase a fee, you necessarily have an impact on the market for housing. And of course that would include affordable units. And finally, there was a question about the cost recovery percentage. Uh, what's meant here, as I interpret it, is this. For every service for which the department charges a fee, what percentage of our costs related to that service are we recovering? That's the question. So we're looking at these issues. Um, we're currently doing a comparison with the other jurisdictions that I mentioned. Um, also, I'm going to be engaged in case studies where we're looking at other um, actual projects that have been done over the years that we're going to take a look at and say, well, okay, if these fees had been in place at the time these projects were done, how much would that have meant in terms of total fees for each project? And then compare that with the history. Um, and, and these are projects that will be, um, they have been completed relatively recently. For example, 999 East Rio is one of them. Uh, the building that houses a Starbucks down at the street station is another one. Uh, have three other single family detached residents, one of which is, a, uh, is considered an affordable housing unit. So we're gonna be looking at all of those to get an idea of what the impact would be. And for it, as a, uh, again, as a tangible benchmark, something that people can look at and say, oh yes, we know that project. Uh, we know when it was completed. We know a lot about the specifics and here's how this, Proposed, these proposed changes would have impacted those projects. Um, so the remaining work right now for staff is that we need to complete the case studies, examine the impact on housing costs. And by the way, I should point out one of those projects is a commercial project. So we're also looking at the impact on the commercial side of the real estate market. Um, as I mentioned previously, surveying fees in Hanover County, Henrico, James City County, and Roanoke County for purposes of comparison documenting the cost recovery percentage for proposed fees. Now, I just wanted to say something of a sidebar for existing fees. I don't believe the, the, the um, recovery percentage will change. Um, I, I won't get into all the math behind that, but um, for the time being, uh, my, my, my thinking is that it would not change for existing fees. But we wanna make sure that our proposed fees are consistent with the cost recovery that exists in, in existing fees. Um, additionally, if after we've done all the study, after we've um, taken our comments in and um, any other information that's relevant, there might very well be potential revisions to the recommended fee updates. Nothing is carved in stone. This is, as I've been telling people earlier, um, we, we've started the process, but we are by no means finished with it. And on that note, I wanted to talk a little bit about the remaining timelines. So on March 3rd of this year, I'm gonna be giving a presentation to the Board of Supervisors. On March 23rd, um, we're coming back for a public hearing with your group, the Planning Commission. And on April 21st, the board will have a public hearing on the fee updates. And again, for anyone listening in or would like any more information than what I've provided here, who might be in the listening public, um, they're able to visit this URL site. Um, they can go down on our page where it says community development fees, click that link and they'll have access to all the documents that have been provided um, to your group and also can access the comment box where they're um, more than welcome to leave their comments about our efforts. I should point out that the deadline is February 26th of this year for getting their comments to us. And on that note, I will entertain questions. very much could you unshare your screen okay let me see if and I'm... what was the structure in the background of your present on that last page on that document uh, on the last page yeah um well you know i have to be honest with you i don't know okay <laughs> i don't i um i pulled this off our web website this afternoon but it is a county it is a county structure i would assume so let's but... hope so I, I yes. hope it is. But yeah, okay, let's just we'll just let you and Charles have that little conversation, that sidebar conversation. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, questions uh, for the presentation we had this evening. 
So, so I'm going to start, I start off before we get to Corey. So, so I, I understand why we're hearing this this evening because it's in the zoning ordinance. But I frankly have to say I'm surprised that this is something that comes before the Planning Commission. And so as you're doing your sort of uh, survey around the communities, I'd like to ask that you sort of look to see a number of other jurisdictions that just sort of deal with this as a matter of you doing your business as opposed to bringing it to us. And uh, so I don't know if, if I'm speaking out of term, out of, out of term, Mr. Rapp, but I, it just seems like this is a, an odd thing or, oh, I see the counselor has his hand up. I, I will defer to the counselor. So Mr. Bivens, you can, you can blame me for this. Um, because it's an amendment to the zoning ordinance, the fee structure exists in the zoning ordinance. Zoning ordinance amendments, amendments go through the planning commission. Come through us, okay. All right, well, perhaps we can think about that in the future and amend and, and pass the motion to amend um, and take it out. So I'll be quiet for a second. I've got some other things, but I will defer to the rest to, to my colleagues. Who else? I said, Corey, you had your hand up. And I know that uh, we, I can tell by Rick's posture that he has a question too. So Corey, then Rick, and then whoever else wants to speak at this moment, please, but Corey and Rick. And Karen. So Corey, Rick, and Karen, and Tim. Oh, thank you. Don't, you, can't, you can't stay out of it, Daniel and Louise. You can't. You might have a full, I might have a full house here. <laughs> so Corey, Rick, Karen, Tim, and then Daniel, and I know Luis is going to have something from there. I totally understand that we have to run a sustainable organization. So it seems like the, the reason for this hike is because it hadn't been done in quite some time, which came up to that 10%, I think I saw in your presentation. That's correct. Yeah. Hypothetically speaking, if this all goes forward and whatnot, um, will it be the plan to get back on that every two year track that, that we somehow slipped off of? I, I believe it would, yes. I mean, per board policy, this should be done every two years. Good. Karen, excuse me, Rick, Rick. Uh, noting that remark, um, I would just point out that when the original fees were agreed to in 2008, there was a little economic event going on in the U.S. economy that began with Lehman Brothers that August called the near depression. And the board essentially since then, because I know we talked about this as a board, the board subsequently did not feel that it was appropriate to increase any fees. Not that the fees were untouchable, but it was just not a politically appropriate time to increase those levies. Um, and I would just note that past board practice to not increase the fees on a two-year cycle does not equate with a board policy. The board reserves the right not to follow the policy mm -hmm. at a two-year interval. So to state that the policy is that it will be changed every two years is not an accurate remark. Now, the second thing that, that I would note here is that there is an assumption made in one letter criticizing this proposal about money being dedicated to a software upgrade and asserting that any software upgrade will automatically result in increased uh, efficiency. And that's not necessarily the case as all of us having lived through Microsoft Windows upgrades in the past recognize that efficiency did not follow with those upgrades. But I'm, I'm not casting aspersions on the proposed software upgrade here. I think the aim is probably to have better communication and coordination across departments by having the software, and thereby it may create some efficiencies, but that doesn't mean in an economically uh, laissez-faire definition of efficiency that it's automatically going to be saving the county on an annual basis, any amount of money. And then uh, coming to Steve's defense here, I just want to talk about the reason why he was utilizing Fairfax or Alexandria. Well, Albemarle County is a high growth community. We're part of the high growth coalition in the General Assembly. And as a high growth community, we look to our peers 
that are also seeing significant annual growth rates for what they're doing as best management practices. That other counties have not gone down this direction doesn't mean we shouldn't. In fact, um, it's a really sound management that we're proposing to do this now and keeping good company. And I would assert if we do that, then our normal peers that we look at as comparable communities, such as James City, Roanoke, and uh, Hanover, that they will follow, and Spotsylvania, which was not on one list I saw, that those communities may well follow Albemarle in looking at this kind of an overall scheme to generate revenue. The other thing I'll point out, the more of these kinds of revenues can come into the county to counterbalance the costs of dealing with applications, the less the burden is on where the majority of the taxes are paid in this county, which is by homeowners, not by businesses, but by homeowners. And so this proposal is just asking people applying for applications to pay their fair share. And when you look at the minor adjustments here, you cannot fathom how there could be any impact here on affordable housing. With a thousand dollars a year, you're going to or an additional thousand dollars in all the applications that one might have to make for a special use permit, that that's going to jeopardize a commitment to affordable housing. The affordable housing card is being played in many games currently, not always with high stakes and not always with clarity of purpose. Karen. Uh, I was just curious as to whether, um, it, I was wondering if Steve could talk a little bit more about efficiencies to be realized by the new software. I'm not questioning whether we need new software. I'm just wondering, is there any kind of cost savings or increased efficiency that it would provide that would offset of the need to increase fees? That's my question. I can't speak specifically about any efficiencies at this point because I don't know a what software system we would eventually end up with. So it's, it's it, I'd be speculating at this point, but I do know in conversations I've had with members of the department. Um, that our current system is um, somewhat clunky. Um, and I, I'm seeing right now we are beginning to in the process uh, to replace the software. But um, again, I don't I, I can't speak specifically, but I do know that if we do go to a new system, that very likely would streamline the process. Um, if you think about um, the way that IT technology has increased, Notwithstanding snafus with upgrades uh, in, in Microsoft, um, there have been productivity increases. I, I think the private sector has realized those over the last 16 years. And I think our thinking is that we would, um, would benefit from that. Um, one other little piece that I might say is that if we do streamline our process and can get development review times shortened to some extent, um, Look, you know, time is money in the world of building and development. So this might also benefit the people paying the fees. Um, it might benefit the builders. It might benefit the developers. So it remains to be seen, but that would be my thinking at this point. Tim. Thanks. My colleagues have hit my point, Steve. Well conceptualized and, and well presented. Thank you. Uh, the one piece that I look forward to are the comparables so that we can see what a minor part of the cost of a unit really will be. I'm sure it's going to be less than a percent that we're talking about. Um, and I think uh, that builds on what Rick said. I just want to echo, I, no one could say it better than Rick just summarized the issues that we're seeing of affordable housing being thrown up all the time as an excuse for things that aren't happening. I think this body and the Board of Supervisors are really endeavoring to deal with affordable housing. And some of these points are just, just do not hold water that's coming out of um, certain communities. So 
we are dedicated to that. We all know that. Um, and I think that your work will show the small amount of impact that it will have on affordable housing. Thank you. I'm, I'm joined this evening, by the way, by Amelia McCauley. I'm not sure if she wants to, um, wants to uh, uh, say anything at this point regarding our technology. Why, why, don't, I, why don't I give uh, Amelia the opportunity to come in and just and be the uh, and be the cleanup batter once all of us have said what we need to say. If you're okay, okay with that, Daniel. Corey, did you go? I think you were in front of me. I don't want to. Corey's right, already Corey's already like jumped in. I, I y'all better you know you young fathers better get this stuff together here. Yeah, uh, I didn't want to jump anybody in line. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I'll keep brief. You know. Brief look uh, and, and reading through. Thank you for putting this together. I think it was very informative, um, and, and I understand there's still work to be done, and, and appreciate that. Um, you know, on the surface, it's a 10% increase if you use the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, Consumer Price Index Inflation Calculator. Inflation's risen since 2015 by 11%, so it's actually not even tracking with inflation and to cover salary adjustments. So. I don't, I don't see, you know, on the surface, some of the, you know, it's not like we're going for a 30% and, you know, and outpacing just the cost of a dollar. Uh, presumably, I bring that up that 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 same inflation goes through to the selling price of developers and others that are that are paying some of these fees on what they can demand for their housing. Um, so they're able to demand more than than what they're they were in 2015 based on that cost of a dollar. Um, uh, so I'll keep that, you know, that's just a, an observation there that it's not even tracking current inflation per the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, and then as a software engineer and, and owner of a software company, I will wholeheartedly agree with you that it, uh, on lots of things, I've used County View, I've applied for permits myself to do things at, at my house, and it is a horrible user experience on the outside. Um, it's, it's a 1990 system, and, and software certainly has a, a life cycle, um, and so I appreciate that. Productivity gains, um, there, there's more, you know, we, we also have measures in the software industry called usability index, and that's not just, that's not just uh, productivity gains by by someone using it, but it's the ability to use it and not just for the staff, but for uh, the other stakeholders that county use services. Um, and so I think there's there's a lot to be said there as well. So with that, I'll conclude my feedback. Thank you. Luis. I actually don't have a desire to go, <laughs> so, believe it or not. I think you guys have covered it and it was a, it was a very well done presentation. I certainly appreciate the expansion of other other counties. I think that's appropriate, uh, particularly since it's been raised. All right. So I'll, before I before we give it to Amelia, so I just have a couple things here. So um, one of my things is that you know when you're looking for for what to tie this to, I wouldn't. I would. I would also ask you to give some sense to looking at at the construction escalators, because that's the package of goods, that's the package of activities that developers are actually dealing with when they go to put projects together. And so while I appreciate that we're doing it as a function of, of, of salaries, of, of, of county salaries, that that really is not tied into the business that's coming before us to, to sort of, for these, for these fees, that's a, it's not really aligned effectively with the fees. I think there's a different kind of argument that one can look at if you looked at the, constru the construction industry and looked at the whole host of escalators that they had before, before them that would tie in nicely to what Daniel said. So as you're looking at this, I would just suggest that you give a, you give a look over to, the, to, that, to those indicators to see how they might tie in with this. And um, I also, you know, to, to, to counter my colleagues, these costs are de minimis. I think it was Amelia said, or maybe it was Amelia and Jody said that during the pandemic, we've done something like a hundred million dollars worth of projects. A hundred million dollars worth of projects. The typical project that comes before this before this body is well over twenty million dollars when you're talking about these big developments. And so, if we're talking about a two thousand dollar fee 
for a $20 million project. I'm having a hard time. So, and I'm pro business. I'm like a business guy, but I'm having a hard time sort of figuring out how that's a really hard thing, particularly if, and those of you who have not seen it, Sean Tubbs did this piece on the housing, the housing stock in Charlottesville this weekend. For those of you who, who are on his, on his, on his, on his, um, uh, I don't know what you call those things. You, you all, you, you guys know that stuff. Like, but on one of his newsletters, any e newsletter, the prices in the city for existing property is off the chart. Off the chart. It's off the chart. And this is existing. This is existing housing. So you see, so so if we are talking about big, magnificent, planned communities that are going to give lots of good places for our people to live, paying two thousand dollars for a rezoning it seems like a reasonable cost of business, particularly when you do a kitchen in one of these houses and the kitchen is probably going to cost you $4,000. And that's just for one kitchen. So I'm having, I, I ha oh, oh, I see a, oh, a higher. Oh, go ahead. I'm not even going to leave it there. So I just got thumbs up. So maybe we're talking about $10,000 per kitchen, $6,000 per kitchen. So I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding why this is a, why, why this would be something that would cause angst given that for labor and, and finishing and, and, and I'm hearing that people can't even get, get the, um, uh, they can't even get pine to do, stru to do structures today, that that's a hard resource to come in, that the price on pine and, 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 and board has, has gone up greatly. That's my rant on that. My other piece on this is that for the technology fee, I have to share with you, and this is where I probably would go, go sideways with my colleagues, I don't think you should charge a technology fee. And let me tell you why. We don't charge a new technology fee when we enhance the HR system. We don't charge a technology fee when we, when we enhance the 911 system. We don't charge a technology fee when we do a whole bunch of things that provide services to the community. And so I don't want community development to have to fall into, I've got to be able to sing for my new technology. If the institution, if the county is saying that this is an important enhancement for us to do what we do, that I think this is that I would like you to sort of try and look at the argument when you look at your look at some of our colleagues. If we are committed as a community to do this, then we should say we're going to invest. In, we're going to invest in technology, and that's just part of what we do. That's part of how we have. We have, we invest in our people so our people can do their jobs. And then, and then I think the rest of this, then I'll just shut up and be quiet and say, thank you very much. And now let's hear from Amelia. Show me the money, Julie. Hey, hey you, you, you know my whole thing. You talk about we, you, I will, because I know there are people who are looking at us, but the model of being, of being residential folk, being residential in tax income focused, is part of our problem. It's part of our problem. I get it. I understand where we're living, but we cannot do the kinds of things that we, we claim we want to be as, a, as an incredible community and depend uniquely on, on, on residential taxes. And I'm sure that'll be all over the various things tomorrow, but you know, I'm so sorry, but that's just how I feel. Amelia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Amelia McCulley, Deputy Director of Community Development. I, I appreciate your insight into uh, to have or not to have a technology fee. Uh, you make a you make a good point. Uh, of course, this is a major startup cost, and this is one way to begin to accumulate some money to offset that cost. Week, one week, $19 million value of construction and building permits. So I'm not talking about development applications. I'm purely talking about building permits. I just thought it'd be a little bit of uh, trivia there. Bravo for the team for doing that because we know some of our communities that surround us and who are in the Commonwealth have basically been forced to close down because of the COVID-19 situation. But I think we should be, that's a, that's a story that needs to be shared across our community that we have helped to keep this industry moving. And we have helped to sort of get out of the way and make sure that people can, can, can have new homes and refurbish their homes to have a, to have a life that, that, that's a function of them having to work from home. And hopefully they have 
open and hopefully they have internet capability to do that. Yes. A couple of quick words. Uh, we were talking a little bit about the technology and what that's going to bring us in terms of process improvement and customer service uh, improvement. And I am not surprised to hear what Mr. Bailey has said about the interface because one of the significant needs for improvement is a customer interface. Whether you're you're a, a common uh, frequent customer who's coming again and again doing business with the county as a builder, developer, you name it. It's not an easy interface. It's very hard to navigate. Um, it's even more difficult if you're a member of the public who's trying to figure out what's going on in your neighborhood and you hardly ever interact with it. Um, so along with our technology investigation, we're gonna be working on process improvements, working on an improved customer interface. Uh, one of the process improvements, I'll give you an example. We're, we're looking at a front end software that will help us process applications as they come in to make sure that they are complete before we take them. Changes like that can allow you to go from review in series or sequentially to parallel review. That alone, where you have all your reviewers looking at the same plans at the same time can save time. You know, we have, we're just at the beginning of this process with the whole replacement of county views. So a lot, a lot of that remains to be seen but I thought it'd be worth just a few minutes to be responsive to your question. Thank you. So do you have what you need? Oh, Daniel. Just one, one quick question, piggyback. Is, is County View uh, mobile friendly? Not is really. It? Okay, I, that, I'm just that, curious. As, no, sir. That's it's, it's unless you have, unless you're unless carrying your desktop, unless you're carrying Rick's desktop <laughs> with you. If you have, no, have Rick's, Rick's with a big screen. <laughs> then it works really well then for it, you. Then it works. <laughs> I, you know, it's it's largely servicing a deskless workforce. So uh, exactly. And mobile. So thank you. Just curious. Anything else? Do you get what you needed from us? You did? Great. Thank you thank, very much. Thank you very much. And we'll look forward to seeing you in March again. How's that? Is that Thanks, good? Steve. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night. Committee reports. No committee report. Oh, here's a committee report. Corey. Uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, I attended the uh, CAC for uh, Pantops recently. And uh, the, the essentially the, the gist of that meeting was a proposal for a new hotel uh, that would mm -hmm. coming up just beyond, if you know, where the Bojangles was at the Sun Trust, I think. It's a lot directly beside that. So it was a kind of a, an introductory meeting to that concept, if you will. If you remember from um, Kevin McDermott's presentation, that whole corridor is part of smart funding. Mm -hmm. Supervisor has shared that that project had been approved, which would uh, eliminate what was called the suicide lane uh, that runs down, you know, beyond tip top to the bottom of the hill. Mm -hmm. So all of that would start working together. But that was a proposal that was talked about that'll be coming before this body at some time in the future. Thank you, others. Tim, please. MPO Tech um, organizing meeting for the beginning of the year. And as we were meeting, we were having the smart skill scoring results passed to us project by project um, from our VDOT representative. And uh, after each one, there was a big hoo-ha and some applause as we were, they were really shocked and we were shocked as well that Charlottesville Albemarle did as well as it did. Of course, we all have to realize that this is the internal staff recommendations for the scoring. I'm sure that you've all seen them in the paper. Um, if not, you can go to the Thomas Jefferson soon to be renamed Planning District Commission for the results. Anything else? Any other committee reports? So I will just share briefly, we have the um, uh, CAC, the hydraulic 29 CAC here. And the only piece that I would suggest if you haven't done it for your own CAC is having Michaela come and do sort of the, the primer on 
on what a CAC is and what are the FOIA and all the various pieces because it was actually, she, A, she does an excellent job and B, um, the people who are new to CAC, there's, there probably isn't an easy way for them to have heard that information. So it was helpful for a, for a number of people who were brand new since a, num a significant number of ours had, had just sort of timed out. And so if you need that, she's an excellent resource for that. Anyone else? Charles. All right. On uh, January 20th, uh, the board met uh, to discuss Breezy Hill once more. Um, there was a motion uh, that did not pass uh, with a 3-3 with three, three vote from the board supervisors. Therefore, that uh, application uh, was uh, did not pass and was denied. So um, I believe that will be all of Breezy Hill for a while. Um, there was also uh, the board moved to uh, adopt the zoning text amendments for outdoor storage and outdoor activities that recycling in uh, uses in industrial um, zoning districts. It came before this commission a couple months ago, I believe. Um, and that was the uh, board activity since our last meeting. I will also share uh, just a bit of scheduling for us. Uh, our work session, we no longer have an item for our February 9th work session. Uh, we were going to talk about some of the, the, the next step of the Crozet Master Plan. Uh, but I will say we got uh, a lot of uh, very helpful, constructive feedback from this commission, from members of the public, uh, from the, the CAC, and we'll continue to do so. Uh, we wanted to have a little more time to make sure we address some of those concerns and, and uh, uh, give it a give it a thorough job before we bring it back to the uh, to the commission. So we will be revisiting that in March at our work session. Uh, so our next actual meeting date will be February sixteenth, when we have a public hearing uh, for the form based code for the Route twenty nine uh, small area plan area, and uh, we'll also provide an update on the Rio corridor uh, study that study. we are working on. This, this should be coming off uh, here shortly. Mm -hmm. Anything else for Charles? Questions for Charles? Charles, uh, um, thank you for that. And uh, uh, on behalf of, first of all, unless somebody wants to say they don't, but I'm going to say on, the, on behalf of the commission to thank you for your staff for the work that they're doing in Crozet and the work, particularly, I, I look forward to hearing what's happening in the, um, on the Rio, on the, um, on the Rio, on the Rio corridor. Because I know there's a number of pieces over there that have, that have been, um, but that will have an impact on some of the projects that we're looking for over there, or they're looking to go forward over there, or looking not to go forward over there, depending on what they are. So thank you for your for the work on that, folks. We have another week off. Don't get used to this. That's all I'm gonna say. Don't get used to this. Is there any other business or new business that needs to come up or you know, items for follow up? Really, what this is all about is so that all of anyone who's going to be watching the Super Bowl, you have a, you have now a week to recover. So while you can't go there, and you can't get tickets, oh, stop looking like that, Rick. So you can't you can't get tickets to the Super Bowl. You can at least stay home and in, and in, and imbibe and enjoy all the chicken wings that you can possibly do for twenty four hours. So on that note, since that no one has anything else. We are adjourning at uh, 8.04, right? We okay? I'm gonna have to get new glasses because you're almost all fuzzy. Um, okay, thank you. Peace, be safe. Remember, in spite of what it says in the New York Times about Albemarle County being, being low on the COVID list, no matter what it says on that, it's still here and it still needs you to wear your mask and, and keep social distance. But have a good time, and I'll see. We'll see everybody uh, next uh, two Tuesdays from now. Okay, get some sleep, Corey. Right. Bye, bye, everyone.